Uh, we'll grab your Bibles and let's go. I want you to put your finger in Genesis chapter 1 and then go back to your New Testament and put it in Ephesians chapter 1. So I'll get there in a moment, but at least you know where we're going now. I'm going to throw out a lot of verses today. I don't mean to overwhelm you with that. Some of you are like, oh, I wish you'd slow down so I could write all these down. They are already written down in your church app if you have that, or you can listen later on. It'll be on YouTube. In some ways, I just want you to listen and take this in. Um, rather than being worried about, did I get every reference right, okay? But let's start off. I want to tell you what we're going to talk about. Today, I want to talk to you about what theologians call God's omnipotence. We've talked about his omniscience, that is, he's all-knowing. We've talked about his omnipresence, he's all-present. And today, we're going to talk about his omnipotence, that is, he's all-powerful. But let's start with a definition because I think that could be helpful in clearing up some misconceptions. And here's how I would define omnipotence. God's omnipotence means that he is able to accomplish all he desires while behaving in a manner that is perfectly consistent with his character. So he's able to accomplish all that he wills, all that he wishes, all he desires, but he does it in a manner that is perfectly consistent with his character. And every part of that is important. But where do we get this from? Where do we get the idea of God's omnipotence? Well, certainly we get it from Scripture. In fact, this is one of those doctrines that you can't escape. There's really no way around it if you'll just read Scripture and hear how it talks about God. So let me just throw out for you, for your consideration, many things that the Bible says. The Bible calls him the Lord, strong and mighty, Psalm 24. Calls him great and awesome, Deuteronomy 7. The Lord Almighty, the mighty one of Israel, Isaiah 1, Jeremiah tells us that nothing is too hard for God. O oh, great and powerful God, whose name is my almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds, Jeremiah 32. You get to the New Testament, there's Mary, Gabriel shows up in Mary's room and says, Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to conceive a child. And she says, I don't understand this. How's, how could this be? Because I've never been with a man. And the angel Gabriel says to her, because nothing is impossible with God. He's all powerful, but nothing can stop God. Not only from just, he, he's all powerful, but nothing stops him from accomplishing his purposes. Listen to how the writers of scripture say, he's so powerful, nothing can thwart his purposes. For the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 14, has planned who can frustrate it. And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? What's the answer? No one. Isaiah 46, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Job says it this way, Job 42, I know that you can do all things, no plan of yours can be thwarted. Job, uh, or Daniel chapter four, Daniel says it this way, he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? But even that's not enough because the Bible's going to call him several times, going to declare that power belongs to the Lord. The owner of all power is God. There is no power apart from what God gives to people. Do you understand? Any kind of power we have or a president has or a premier or a king is all delegated power. And in fact, this is how Jesus talks. Right? Jesus looks at Pilate in John 19 and Pilate says to him, don't you know I have the power and the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Pilate's bragging, goes, I can do whatever I want with you. And Jesus answers and says, you would have no authority, no power over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Paul in Romans chapter 13 talks about governmental authority. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God, God's delegated authority, delegated power. There is no power apart from God. Power belongs to the Lord. But then somebody would say, okay, if God's all powerful, if nothing is impossible, then ah, let me ask you a tricky question. Can God create a stone that he cannot move? You ever heard this? Can God create a rock so big that even God cannot move it? Now, you're on the horns of a dilemma, aren't you? Right? The dilemma being, if I say yes, then God is not all-powerful because there's now a, there's a stone too big. If I say no, well, then God can't do something. 
What's the answer? What's the answer? Can God create a rock, a stone so big that he can't move it? The answer is, uh, can he do that or can he not? No, he cannot. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's ask the question another way. Is there, now don't answer this out loud. Is there anything that God can't do? And the answer is, hold on, yes. There are lots of things that God can't do. Now, before you burn me at the stake for being a heretic, let me show you what I mean. Remember, what we said is, his omnipotence means he can accomplish all his purposes in a way that is perfectly consistent with his character. So when we say, okay, well, are there things that God cannot do? Let's, let's first start here and say this. God is the ruler. God created everything. We'll see this in a moment. He rules over all creation. So it is not possible for God to create a horse that can outrun him. It's not possible for God to create a hurricane that is too powerful for him. It's not possible for God to create a rock that is too big for him to move. Why? Because to do that would mean God ceases to be God. To do that would make God a absurd. Like what if I said, hey God, I demand that you produce a, a circular triangle. Well, that's, that's a nothing. That's asking God to produce something that is a nothing. It's the same thing with a rock so big that he can't move it. You're asking God to do something that would make him absurd, that would reduce him down and would say he is not God. But listen, it's not just me. I'm not just trying to make logical arguments. The Bible is gonna tell us to actually talk like this, to say there are some things that God cannot do. So you read your Bible. What does it say? God cannot lie. Does that mean he's not all powerful? God cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy. God cannot ultimately be mocked. People mock God all the time, but he says, the Bible's gonna say, go ahead and do it, but ultimately, like what you sow, you're gonna reap, God won't be mocked. God cannot be contained. We talked about this last week in his omnipresence. Can heaven, even the highest heavens, contain God? So does that mean God is, is not omnipotent? He's, he's, he's not quite as powerful? No. God cannot die. God cannot tempt with evil or be tempted by it. And God cannot sin. Now, let me, let me suggest something to you. When we say God cannot do some of these things, that is not, um, that doesn't make the case against his omnipotence. It makes a case for it. Now, let me, let me help you understand what I mean here. It's saying because God is perfectly consistent with his character, there are some things that God cannot do. Omnipotence is the power to accomplish all he wills in a manner perfectly consistent with his character. So, so okay, um, this means that God and God alone, he's the only being in the universe that can act in a, in a manner that is perfectly consistent with his character. You and I can't do that. Now we want to. We desperately want to talk and act and be you know, in a way that, that reflects, but we don't have perfect character to begin with, so no wonder we falter and fail. We, we, we sin. Why do, why, what's one of the reasons we sin? Well, one of the reasons is because I have a war. I don't know about you. Certainly, the Bible's gonna say all of us have this war inside of us that is the flesh against the spirit and sometimes the flesh wins and overpowers me and I am, if we can talk like this, we can say I, I don't have the self-control to say no and so I sin. That'll never be true of God. It'll never be true that God is overpowered by something, that, that there's something bigger than him, that he's enslaved to something. So when we say God is not all powerful, well, he's not all powerful, he can't sin or die or be tempted. No, in fact, we're proving how powerful he genuinely is because he's the only one who can say no to all of that. He's the only one who can live consistently with that. It is not power to be able to sin. You follow me? It's not power to be tempted. It's not power to die. 
all of those in Scripture are, are testimonies of weakness, not power. So we can say, God, look at him. He, he'll never lie. Perfectly consistent. He'll never die. Because his character says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He cannot tempt or be tempted with even the evil of making a rock too big that he can't move it. The smallest to the greatest. God can't do any of those things and that shows that he's perfectly consistent. Now, what you're gonna see is that this power is everywhere in scripture. This power to accomplish all that he wills in a manner that is perfectly consistent with his character is woven from the beginning to the end of Scripture. But here's something really important for you to understand. Scripture does not reveal everything about God's power. Right? So, so we've said before that if I think of God like, a, like an iceberg, what's an, the iceberg bobs there on the water and what's above the surface you can see, let's imagine this is God. This is what he's revealed of himself, but the, 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 the biggest portion of the iceberg is under the water that we can't see. Well, this is the Lord. God is bigger. There's so much more. In fact, here again, this is how the Bible's gonna talk. So, so we, get to, we get to Job um, Job chapter 26, behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways and how small a whisper do we hear of him. Here's Job saying that after I describe all these things that I see in the universe that declare storms and you know the, the, the seas rolling and all these things, he says, these are but the outskirts of God's power. They're just a whisper as if Job would say, what would happen if we really could see the center of power? What would happen if God didn't whispered but proclaimed and yelled? What kind of things could this God do? Or how about Habakkuk chapter three? It says this, his splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled his power. Now, do you hear this? That as I look at the vastness of the universe, as I see stars, I see all the things that God has done and these rays coming from his hands and the, and the writer, the, 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 the prophet Habakkuk says, this is all veiled power, not unveiled power. So Arthur Pink writes this, he says, Habakkuk sees the mighty God scouring the hills and overturning the mountains, which one would think afforded an amazing demonstration of his power. No, says verse four, that is rather the hiding than the displaying of his power. What does it mean? This, so inconceivable, so immense, so uncontrollable is the power of deity that the fearful convulsions which he works in nature conceal more than they a reveal of his infinite might. Wow. It's as if the prophets are saying, look at this. L look at a God. You've, here's what he reveals about himself. And this is just the outskirts. This is just a whisper. What kind of God are we dealing with here? All powerful, invincible power perfectly consistent with his character. Now let's, let's walk through scripture a little bit. I want to just show you some things. And again, we're going to show you a lot. I can't show you everything, but, but let's, let's kind of take some samplings of where we see this invincible power. And the first place we'll start is the invincible power of God in creation. So you're in Genesis, okay? A very familiar passage to a lot of you, but let's just, let's just take one little piece of this. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so this is, this is Moses' way of saying the universe was created by God. Now, how? Let's just take one portion of it. Verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Go down to verse 14. We'll continue on lights. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give the light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made, verse 16, the two great lights, the great light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the, the night 
and the stars. Did you see that? He creates the sun, he creates the moon, and as almost a, by the way, God created the stars. Just no biggie, just stars. How far is it from earth to the sun? It's about 93 million miles. How far is it from the sun to the nearest star? Let's, let's scale this so that we can think of it in terms we might understand. If we called a million miles one inch, how far would it be from the earth to the sun? 93 million miles, somewhere around eight feet. Let's put the earth here. Let's walk over eight feet. Let's put the sun here. Now, how far is it from this sun to the nearest star in inches? Because I want to, you know, is that 100? Is it, is it maybe 100 feet? 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 10,000 feet? If I wanted to measure it in inches, and I'm going to build my scale model here. I'd put planet Earth here. I'd put the sun here. And I would put the nearest star in Chico. I can't do that. I can't, I can't put it in this room. So that when you get that far, and by the way, that's inches. When you get that far, um, we're dealing with numbers we can't really even comprehend. So this is why scientists will tell us that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. You've probably heard this. So when we talk about that next nearest star, they'll say it's 4.5 light years away, which means that light left that nearest star. Go out tonight, and if you can see the nearest star to us, not the sun, but the nearest star to us, it left that star four and a half years ago, and you're seeing it today. And God did it all by the sheer power of his voice. And Job said, it's just a whisper. But he didn't stop there. He doesn't just create. Like, listen, by the way, no artist can do this. No, no artist can, can look at a canvas and say, Mona Lisa. You can't look at a slab of marble and say, David. You, you, uh, an architect can't stand in a field and go, you know, Taj Mahal. That, 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 that does not happen, right? We can't create anything. God creates with his words. Remember I said he's perfectly consistent with his character because everything comes out of his mouth is reality. There's a complete 100% matchup between who God is and what he says. When he says it, it's done. We can't do it. In fact, we talk bad about people who are all talk. Their actions don't match up. All of God's talk are his actions. But it goes further. It's not just that God creates and wow, isn't he a magnificent artist? Well, artists have materials. Artists have tools. God had nothing. He had himself and he had his voice. He had no pre-existent matter to deal with. You get this? Like this is not some, you know, universal junk pond over here that God could draw out of and go, I want to make a tree. No, he just said tree. He, he just said elephant. He just went blue whale. He went oceans. He went vegetation. He said sun. And how about, oh yeah, stars. And it was so. How powerful is God? How powerful is the word of God? It's significant that when we open up Scripture, we say this is the Word of God. No wonder Timothy can say, Paul can say to Timothy, Timothy, preach the Word. Because Timothy, it has the power to rebuke and correct and train and do everything. All we need, the power of the Word of God. I've told you guys before, if you want to hear the voice of God, read your Bible. If you want to hear it out loud, read it out loud. This is God's word and it's powerful. Um, R.C. Sproul talking about creation, he says it's, it'd be good to think of it kind of this way. Um, 
imagine, he says, a lot of us have been to see a magician. And the classic magician trick is what? Pulling a rabbit out of a hat, right? So the magician has the top hat and he pops it open, takes his wand and shows you inside, right? He punches his hand through perhaps, makes sure he wants to show you in every way, look, an empty hat, right? And then he magically reaches in and out pulls a rabbit, right? It's an amazing thing, you know, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, is it mirrors? I, I don't know how they do it. But nobody in the audience thinks to themselves, whoa, that dude's God. He just created a rabbit ex nihilo <laughs> out of nothing. No, we all know something's going on. We, we know it's not the wand and the stage and the hat and all this. Something else is going on. So Sproul, listen to what R.C. Sproul says. In the Christian view of creation, there is no stage, no wand, no hat, no concealed rabbit, but at least a magician is present. The magician happens to be self-existent and eternal. He is omnipotent. I know that he does nothing that is irrational, but much that is mysterious. I still don't know how he produced the rabbit, but I do know he did it without mirrors. How did God do what he did? I don't know, but he did it. And his word is power, invincible power. But let's keep going because we also see the invincible power of God in redemption so that what you see in scripture is that when God wants to save, when God wants to rescue, when God wants to deliver people, nothing and no one can stand in his way. Nothing. God will save. God will deliver. God will rescue. God will redeem. So you have stories in the Old Testament, right? And one of those stories is the most powerful ruler in the world at the time, Pharaoh, and, and Moses coming to him and saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, you know, this is, and Moses says, this is demanded by God. Pharaoh says, oh, who is this God that I should obey him? I don't know the Lord. And the rest of Exodus is God proving who he is. And what does he do? Pharaoh disobeys. And God looks at Pharaoh and says, do, do you really think you can stand in my way? Let me show you how powerful I am. So by the time you get to Romans, Paul's going to talk about this and says, says that Scripture said to Pharaoh, it's actually God who says it, but Paul links the two together. That's why the word of God is power. He says, Scripture says of Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Pharaoh, ruler of the world, the one who's the most powerful ruler known to man, you are a pawn. You are nothing. You will not stand in my way. And so what happens? All that Israel has to do to be delivered out of the hand of the mightiest kingdom on planet earth, all they had to do was stand up and walk away. And on the way out, knock on some doors and go, hey, can you give us all your silver and gold? Sure, take it, take it. And they just walk away. They don't lift a finger. There is no epic battle. Do you know this? So that when Moses recounts the Exodus in the book of Deuteronomy, which just means second law, he's recounting and saying, guys, let's go back and remember how God delivered us and the laws he gave to us in light of that deliverance. And, and five times in the book of Deuteronomy, he says this, God delivered us with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. We did nothing. Pharaoh's armies chased us to the Red Sea. What did we do? We didn't, you know, pick up our shields and spears and start fighting and, you know, try to kick Pharaoh back. No, God said, watch this. Open up the waters. You guys walk through on dry land. You get to the other side and I will vanquish the enemy. I will vanquish the entire Egyptian army on my own. This is a picture of, that the New Testament picks up on and says this is salvation. That with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God redeems his people. So that Paul will say, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, danger or sword? No. He'll go on 
to talk about our salvation and say those whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Theologians say this is Paul creating a golden chain, if you will, an unbreakable chain, all by his power. Nothing will limit me from saving. When I want to rescue, when I want to redeem, nothing and no one can stand in my way. This is the invincible power of God in redemption. But how about the invincible power of God in Christ? Paul's going to tell us in Colossians that in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell so that the writers of the New Testament and the gospel writers especially are at great pains to show us how Jesus is God, very God. He is the omnipotent God incarnate. So he does things that only those with omnipotence can do. He walks on water. He raises the dead. He commands demons to flee and they flee. He rebukes a storm. Right? In, in the Bible, it says, I mean, it's, it's raging. And he says, stop. And boom. It's not like it, okay, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. No, boom. Dead calm. Now, if you saw this, you would say, just like the apostles, and so would I, you would look at him and say, who is this? What sort of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? He's the sort of man who's an omnipotent God. That's what we're dealing with. The invincible power of God in Christ. Let me give you one last thing because the Bible is going to say that when you and I trust in Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in that invincible power, when we look at what Christ has done on the cross and we say only that, that and that alone, I believe is sufficient to satisfy what God requires and to bring me into relationship with him. And I'm going to trust in that and that alone. I'm not going to trust in my good works. I'm going to trust in what Christ and his sacrifice has done for me. He says, when that happens, then that invincible power is now in you. And this is how the Bible is going to talk about you that the invincible power of God comes to take up residence in you. How is this possible? Ray Ortland's a pastor and he says, this is like putting nuclear fuel in a paper bag. Something has to reinforce the paper bag to take that nuclear fuel. And the something to be able to receive the power of God is the presence of his Holy Spirit in your life reinforces. Now God comes. This is the most incredible miracle of all. God comes to take up residence. How does he do that, Chris? I don't know. But the Bible says he comes to take up residence. And now the very power of God is available for me. It's available for you. So, okay. I told you to turn to Ephesians. So watch this. Here's Paul. Paul's going to pray twice in the book of Ephesians. Listen to how he prays. It's in the Bible because this is reality. This is the word of God. So Paul says, man, I'm praying like this, verse 15, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love towards all the saints. In other words, I, I, I believe you're Christians. I don't cease to give thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, that's amazing, okay? We could probably talk about that all day. Let's keep going, though. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. You couldn't see what you now see because the Spirit of God, that you may know 
What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? How much hope would you have if you genuinely knew how rich you were in Christ? I don't mean material riches. I mean all that's laid up for you. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Keep going. He just keeps praying. It's what God is doing by his power, his immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Turn over to Ephesians 3. Look down at verse 14. Paul starts praying again. I bow my knees before the Father. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in his inner being. Look at me. I dare say there's nothing you need more or I need more this week than that right there. I need that more than money. I need more, that more than a job. I need that more than anything that Christ would strengthen me by his power in my inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see what's happening here? power that's available to you. Now watch this. Now to him, verse 20, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know what it means when you see according to? Think in harmony with, in proportion to, in accordance with, this is the idea of, 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 of ex, in exact proportion to the power that God has is the power that's available to you. To strengthen you, to fill your hearts with faith, to root you in love, to, to, to root out sin, to do works in your lives, to help you. Listen, I don't know what you came in with today. I know we all came in with something. I know some of you are here and you're suffering with anxiety. I know some of you are here and you are fearful about something that's going down in your life. I know some of you are here and saying, man, there's a relationship in my life that's falling apart and I have no power to do anything about it. I know some of you are here on the brink of divorce. I know some of you are here that something's failing at work. We, there's some, some of you are here sick in body, in mind in all kinds of things. And here's a God saying, I am able to do far more abundantly beyond all you could ask or think according to the working of his great power. That's available to you. Listen to how John Stott, and I'll close with this, summarizes this. He looks at Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, and he looks at seven things. Number one, he is able to do or to work for he is neither idle nor inactive nor dead. Number two, he's able to do what we ask for he hears and answers prayer. Isn't that good news? Number three, he's able to do what we ask or think for he reads our thoughts and sometimes we imagine things for which we dare not and therefore do not ask. Number four, he's able to do all that we ask or think for he knows it all and can perform it all. Number five, he's able to do more than, that's the idea behind beyond, all that we ask or think for his expectations are higher than ours. He's able to do much more or more abundantly than all we ask or think for he does not give his grace by calculated measure. And number seven, he's able to do very much more, far more abundantly than all we ask or think for he is a God of super abundance. Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anyone so far gone that they're outside of his reach? Is there any sickness he cannot heal? Is there any sin he cannot overcome? What's the answer? There's none. He can do all things. And the only thing he cannot do is go against his character. Listen, if all I could say to you is we serve an all-powerful God, we might shudder in terror. But I can say we serve an all-powerful God who is good 
and gracious and kind and merciful who not only can do, but wants to do. What a promise. Let's pray. Father, oh, I thank you. I thank you that even now as I pray to you, I don't pray to a wooden idol. I don't pray to a God who cannot hear. I don't pray to a God who cannot reach and do and doesn't have the power to accomplish everything we would bring to you. And so, Father, we, we come to you now, and God, there are people in this very room right now who are struggling. There are struggles of depression and anxiety and fear and worry and finances and health and relationships. They know somebody who's far from God, and they seem, they've given up hope thinking there's no way And I pray once again, remind us of the truth of Scripture. You are able to do. And now I pray that in your goodness, in your kindness, in your mercy, you would do. God, I pray for people in this room that need the most significant miracle of all for you to take and use your power to transform a heart of stone into a heart of flesh that you would draw them to yourself, give them eyes to finally see, ears to finally hear, and today would be the day of salvation. And we ask all this in your beautiful name, Jesus.